The leaders of a coup in Niger are digging in their heels as a deadline from neighbors to give up power came and went. The economic community of West African states, that's ECOWAS, had given them until yesterday to release and reinstate the ousted president, Mohamed Bazoum, or face military action. Instead, the coup leaders have closed Niger's airspace. At the same time, more and more African leaders are striving to getting the continent to play a central role on the world stage. Well, for this, a new generation of leaders appears to be considered and emerging leaders capable of facing up to the challenges of Africans. Let's discuss what the Sahel coups mean for the rest of us in the continent and for the continent itself. I'm joined in studio by Sipo Mantula, a researcher at the Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs. And I'm also joined by Shishua Shishua. Uh, he is the senior lecturer in history at Stellenbosch University in the Western Cape. Also joining the conversation now is Dr. Paul Simon Handy, ISS Regional Director for East Africa and the Horn and a representative to the African Union. He's joining us now this afternoon from Addis Ababa. Gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. Perhaps I could start with you, Dr. Handy, in Addis Ababa. From where you are sitting there, when you are looking at what's happening in Sahel, particularly in Niger, with the AU having condemned uh, the coup, what, how, how are you interpreting what's developing there? Niger is the, is the fourth case in what looks now like a series of um, unconstitutional changes of government, military takeovers, um, uh, against the background on what is seen as uh, increased jihadist activity in the Sahel and, um, and, and what looks like the failure of, uh, uh, of government to, to, uh, to deal with this threat. Um, so we have a military takeover that are strongly condemned by the African Union and regional bodies. I, I need to say that the African Union is the only international organization that actually proscribe, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, try to prevent and condemn um, military takeovers. Not even the UN does that. So the AU has spent years, decades, in actually building a set of frameworks trying to civilize governance in Africa. So military takeovers are actually a sign that governance in Africa is is ill. We have uh, broken governance systems and um, uh, the illusion that military will actually correct a government course uh, is something we've been through. Um, I mean, we've been there uh, right after independence in the 60s. African countries were under military and for some civilian autocratic rule. So we know where that takes us, namely yes, and, nowhere. Yeah, and it's nowhere. And the AU has been very clear over the years. Sipo, perhaps I could bring you in here in studio. I mean, we've seen a lot of focus over decades now yeah. for, for democratic governance yes. in the continent, accountable mm -hmm. governance, you know, to mm -hmm. deal with corruption and stuff. Mm -hmm. Military yeah. uh, uh, coups are never welcome. Yeah. But the noise is that these new leaders, like uh, uh, Traore is making yes. in Niger, is, is getting a lot of attention. I mean, how, how do you balance this? No, no, correctly, Pratin, but look, even if we say the AU have set up the African chart on governance, elections, democracy, but from 1960 to 2012, you had more than 200 military coups. I will say to you, military coups by nature, are politics by other means. And what has happened also, 1958, there was a foreign affairs minister from Ghana, Sake. He explained that military coups must be linked to neo to neo colonialism. It means most of the colonized states in Africa are dealing with the question of the colonizer. Look at the French anti-sentiments in their Sahel region for the past four years. They've been coming from the youth. But also, this militarization of power comes from the undermining of AU constitutive act. But at the same time, ECOWAS is weak. If one looks at ECOWAS, how is the regional body handling military coups in uh, Africa? So I still go back that military coups are politics by other means. From a historical perspective, uh, Sishua, Sishua, let me bring you in here. 
if you look, uh, if you listen to what Sipwe just said and what uh, Paul Simon was saying there in Addis Ababa, it's not the first time we are having a coups, and this is not the first one in the region recently. Since 2020, we've seen Mali, we've seen Burkina Faso, we've also seen Guinea. So, so from a historical perspective, I mean, w w how do we place these this developments there? There's a lot of anti-French sentiment currently, even calls in some of the, I think it was Mali just the other week saying that French is no longer an official language and also they don't want any French uh, uh, soldier on their, on their soil. Well, I think that the, the, the sentiment is, is valid, you know. In a sense, these developments are an open rebellion against French exploitation of the region. Um, and what you see also is uh, these you know, leaders of these juntas embracing China and Russia. Uh, in a sense, they went to Russia, I think, after, after the, this coup occurred. So there is... Um, a recognition that Africa in general and West Africa in particular remains a playground for major powers. But I think we're, we're missing a, uh, it if we simply look at these events as consequences of external players. There are also domestic factors, particularly in relation to the failure of democracy to deliver on the expectations of the citizens. You know, if there was uh, a sense that civilian leaders, for example, have delivered we would have seen st street protests of people taking to the streets to demand for the restoration of civilian rule. What you have seen is the opposite. So there are, there are governance concerns here. The cost of living remains very high. Of course, it's a, almost a tradition in some of these uh, West African countries in terms of uh, the occurrence of coup d'etats. But I think we need to also pay attention to the domestic factors, particularly the uh, failure of, of civilian authorities to uh, to deliver on the expectation of people in relation to the uh, the cost of living, and the uh, civilians then think maybe if we had a, 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 a you know a new system of leadership, maybe these leaders may uh, deliver on expectation. But these are military leaders who are. Uh, so, Mr. Shua, we seem to have lost you there. Hopefully, your connection uh, uh, will, will come back. Oh, are you there? We, you, your connection is a little bit bad, but he's making a point there. Yeah. yeah, are you there, Mr. Shua? No. Yeah, we'll try and get him back. But Sipo, let me bring it in. It looks like from what he's saying, the citizens are saying would like a different form of governance. We don't trust the current uh, uh, democratically elected governments. Yeah. They are not delivering for us. The cost of living is, is, is rising. There is poverty. But does that justify taking over militarily? You see, but then that is not a justification. That is another military strategy. Remember that the military possess power they have access to the presidency, but civilians are the ones who have to wait for the electoral calendar. What my colleague is raising, yes, there is now the, the U-turn towards Russia and China, but also look at Russia and China's role there. Are they coming as private military companies to deal with restoration of constitutional order, or are they there to support military operations? Because what also it is at the center of the Sahel? or the sub-Sahara, is the natural resources of Africa. That's what still brings the Europeans to have this, what I called, appetite for the Sahel region. But the AU, as my colleague was saying, AU can have the frameworks. What about silencing of guns? That initiative, when it was started in 2020, there were already two or three military coups going on. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Handy, where, where is the AU failing? Where, where's the challenge here? It's very easy to get into AU or ECOWAS bashing. Uh, we cannot expect international organizations to be better than the sum of their parts. The AU is just a reflection of African states. And there too, um, if African states are weak, the international, the regional organizations are going to be as weak. So we, we shouldn't put too high expectations on the AU when it's actually a member state driven 
organization. And so if we can't, for, if we cannot put too works. high expectations, Dr. Hand, if we cannot put too high expectations on the AU, how can it assist the Sahel currently? How can it assist Niger? I mean, it has condemned the coups, not just in Niger, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. So how, what, what can we expect then from the AU? We, we should expect ECOWAS and the AU, because we have a subsidiarity principle here, that ECOWAS should go first and the AU will assist. So what we should be expecting is actually not lesser of the norms that have been established over the years, the frameworks the, whose aim was to civilize governance. And there too, I think people are making a lot of confusion. Uh, it's very easy to criticize democracy for the failure of the state. We are dealing with weak states that actually uh, have very little in terms of the capacity to provide public goods. And then we blame democracy for that. Maybe we should leave the, 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 the notion of democracy aside and rather talk about accountable governance, which is what Africans want. I don't think there's any African who wants unaccountable governance, not even from military who actually take the very easy uh, pretext of taking power under the guise of uh, anti-colonialism or, or anti-French sentiment. I think the AU and the ECOWAS are here faced, uh, are facing daunting challenges because um, it, it's, it's the, the fourth country that ECOWAS is now suspending. So even its capacity to, to reach a quorum for decision is actually even uh, uh, challenged here. Yeah, so, so the regional it's about... body itself is finding itself weakened because of, 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 of these coups in that respect. Sishua, Sishua, can I just bring you in? Ca accountability versus uh, uh, democratic governance. People are asking for accountability. That's what Dr. Handy is saying. But I don't think the military can give us that. No, they won't. And the, um, I think the, the, the Nigerians, Marians, and Burkina Faso people would learn very soon that uh, the military leaders who have seized power in these countries uh, will not be any better than those they have removed. Because if anything, they'll be worse because the lack of account accountability will be a major factor. I, I think that, you know, in relation to Paul's point, we should be very careful that we don't simply condemn. Uh, these coup attempts. Yes, we should do that. Condemnation is necessary, but we must also take uh, take a step back and and ex ask ourselves why is this region so prone to coup attempts? For example, compared to Southern Africa or even East Africa. So there's something specific in terms of context about this place. It's a combination, of course, of uh, historical factors such as the role of France in the uh, life of these countries. Um, but we can't also escape the fact that. If democracy continues to fail to deliver on the expectations of the people, people won't feel that they have a stake in defending this kind of political system when the military leaders like these juntas we have seen take advantage, simply advance what are their personal ambitions. Yeah. Is there a message here underlying this SIPO that says perhaps it's time for a new generation of leaders? I'm asking this because we all watched uh, Ibrahim Traore of Niger addressing Vladimir Putin during the Russia-Africa summit in Moscow the other day, it's making some very strong statements about it's time basically to, for everybody, including Russia, to respect Africa's sovereignty, independence, and Africa must be made to, to make its own decisions about who it trades with, who it invites for, for investments. Is it an underlying message that we need a new generation, a new type of leader in Africa who will give us accountable governance? No, correctly, but then we need those generations, and you can see Traore emulating Sankara when he was there. Uh, you can see how uh, Mamadou from Guinea Conakry, you can see Asim Goit. But I, I think for them is how to reform the military politics, the military civil relations of governance. Both the four generals or these young leaders, they've not transformed their own country in terms of electoral democracy. And that's where we are struggling even with Sudan, where you have two generals fighting and there is no solution. But for me, I still go back to that essence of even how do we redefine democracy. I hear my fellow doctor from Addis talks about governance, we live democracy. Maybe it's high time we redefine African democracy, we redefine the rule of law, we, we even redefine elect, I mean, electoral democracy. Because the, the key issue also is that we have neocolonialism that is coming under the pretext of ECOWAS and AU. 
One will say maybe they're the handlers of new colonialism project because they don't understand that there is a link between the former colonizer and the colonized. Okay. In the last part of our discussion, gentlemen, I want us to move away from politics per se to talking about the economic uh, relations of the region. Uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the leaders, 17 African leaders were in, in Moscow, Vladimir Putin talking to him and other Russian leaders about opportunity in Africa. Come and invest, trade with us, come and help us to transform our continent. But in the Sahel currently, the mood is anti-French. And, and, and so much so there's questions about uh, uh, that unit that France created years ago, which is a CAF, the CAF, the, the, I think it's called the Communauté Financière Africaine, which is holding hostage some of the former colonials, uh, colonies rather, of France. Those countries were now independent. But now they don't want anything to do with France. Is this a beginning of a change in economic power relations of the region? Sishua? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I think there's that desire for that sentiment for France to go. I'm not sure that the, troop, the French troops, for example, will be expelled from Niger. Uh, I think that we have to recognize the role of minerals. You see, Niger is very rich in, 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 in uranium and lithium, for example, which are uh, high sought after minerals. So the French are not there because they care about Niger. They are there to exploit these minerals. And even if they are pushed out, and I've seen these leaders, for example, fraternizing already with, with Moscow. Uh, there's a possibility that China is also interested here. Uh, if African leaders do not um, you know, make sure that they relate with these major powers on the basis of their own interests, to say it doesn't matter whether one is Chinese or Russian or the EU or the US or indeed France, what matters is can we define our interests and make sure that these major powers relate to us on the basis of what is good for us. We should not simply be repressing France with Russia, or France with China, or France with the, e with the EU, for example. What is needed is um, a clear uh, um, identification of our own interest and then demanding that these powers be able to relate with us on the basis of those identified interests. Dr. Hand, what's your view on this issue? Uh, this is one of, um, you know, I don't buy this um, uh, narrative of new leaders. Uh, and if they are, these are certainly not the ones we should be expecting. You know, um, we had at the end of the 90s, in the last century, we had the same narrative about new leaders. Um, and if we were to compare those old leaders, the Paul Kagame of this world, the, uh, the um, uh, Yoweri Museveni, uh, the Meles Zenawi of Ethiopia. Um, if we were to compare them with the Traore of today, really there is no comparison. The only, the only similarity is that they took over power um, uh, through a coup. But those leaders had a vision. They had a strategy, not just a vision, but also the strategy and they manage to actually um, uh, uh, rally enough support from the whole international community. What we have today is big talker. This Traore is actually saying one thing and the opposite. Uh, we know what he's against. Uh, uh, he, he stands against, uh, namely anti-France, anti-West. That's fine. But what is he for? He accused old African leaders of begging, going uh, um, uh, around the world and, and begging. But that's exactly what he did. Okay. He went to Russia to beg. So, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah Dr. Handy, sorry is, to come in. Yeah, sorry to cut you there. We, we, we're just getting to the end. And, and, and in, in less than 30 seconds, I'm going to take a quick round from each of you to say, how do we then, sitting here in the southern tip of the continent, in South Africa, when we look at what's happening in the Sahel and West Africa, how do we then interpret things? What kind of future can we expect, Sipo? Okay. Very briefly. I will say to you, the lessons learned for the SADC is to look at the deficit of democracy and the, the issue of dealing with military challenges, because it seems all of these coups also, there is a challenge within internal, the military professionalism. How do we deal with the military? Okay, Sishua, final parting word for you, from you? I think, I think three points for me. The first is to recognize that what's happening there is a clear case of democratic backsliding. 
and it's is very bad for the region. The second issue is to recognize that these new leaders are not are not new leaders at all. They are not pan-Africanist at all. There's, what we have is essentially a toxic mixture of um, militarism and the populists at, uh, at play. The final point, I think, is to recognize the role of external powers. The, the region, as is the continent, remains a playground for these major powers. China, Russia, France, and the EU, and the US. Uh, Africa will have to come to a stage where they put a stop to this. Otherwise, this will continue. Thank you. Dr. Paul Simon Handy, final word to you. Yeah, I pretty much agree with what my colleagues just said. I mean, it's, it's, uh, 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 what this, in my view, shows us is that we actually have to hold together. The role of external powers is important and it's going to grow. What Africa needs is more unity, no kind of uh, division, sowing division, but actually more unity. And it also goes through respecting regional organizations and the AU. Thank you very much, uh, Sipo Mandula, uh, for his research at Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs. Sishua Sishua, Senior Lecturer in History at Stellenbosch University in the Western Cape in South Africa. And Paul Simon Handy, Regional Director for East Africa at the Institute for Security Studies and a representative to the African Union talking to us from Addis Ababa. Thank you very much, gentlemen. There's still a lot to unpack as the days and the weeks come by, but the message is very clear. We just have to be, be very mindful and careful how we look and interpret at what's coming out of the Sahel region.